10, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3. Welcome to a very special edition of CBJ in 30. I'm Bob McElligot, and I'm pleased to be joined today by the general manager of the Blue Jackets, Jarmo Kekalainen. And there are a number of subjects for us to cover today. The first and foremost is, Jarmo, the schedule was officially released yesterday. Uh, a couple days before that, the preseason schedule came out. That starts to get you excited a, a little bit. And then opening night was announced on Saturday, and then late yesterday afternoon, the entire schedule came out. From your standpoint, how real is it that that next season is not that far from starting once you see that actual schedule? Well, no, it's it's set in stone. We know what it is. We've obviously tr done some work with it and studied it. And the hardest job in the league probably is putting together a, a schedule for every team and trying to please every team with their demands and their questions. But it's there now, and, and uh, we're pleased with it. How much input do you get when it comes to the schedule? Do they ask you a lot of things? Do you... I'm sure everybody has their preferences. Like you said, you've got 30 general managers. They all want certain things. You have 30 building managers. They all want certain things. How much input do you get? Well, we, we ask questions, and we have some requests, but it's almost like the referee's job that you don't want to complain too much. You, you study it, and you try to make the best of it, and then you make a few requests, and, and then it's done. And, and uh, like I said, we're pleased with it. How long does it take this thing to come out from the time that they give you an initial draft until you get the final product? It's a it's a hard process, and like you said, it's it's a hard job for that person who's finalizing and trying to please everybody. It takes about a month, I'd say, to go from the uh, the first draft into the final uh, product. I'm not sure exactly. They might start a lot earlier too. So we see it for about a month. So a job you would not want to have is sitting in there putting that schedule together for the league. And it's a hard job, that's for sure, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions every time they come out with those drafts. All right, let's take a look at the uh, schedule. Let's start with the preseason schedule for the Blue Jackets in September. The very first day of preseason play, it's going to be a split squad game. I've got to ask you, that's been something the last couple of years that you guys have done. Do you like that? Do you like the fact you can play two games on the same day and get a lot of players uh, playing on that one date? Yeah, more players get an opportunity to play. The, the fact that I don't like about it is that I can't see both games live, but you can always study the tape, and we'll, we'll split the management too so we can evaluate all the players uh, playing in those two games. But it gives more opportunities, that's for sure. Now, is that one you would go on the road, or would you stay at home? Well, it depends on the lineups. Sometimes there's a player that I absolutely want to see at that time in the first game because of the uh, what happened in Traverse City or what happened in the uh, in the uh, training camp before that. So it remains to be seen how the lineups get divided. And that preseason schedule, obviously, it's pretty quick. As you see in September, it's every other day. And those are go in and play the game and come back because every day you have a different group of players playing. A couple of games with Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and St. Louis is one of those split squad games as well, and Nashville. So it's good competition right out of the shoot with your young players. And do you feel that a preseason schedule like this really gives you a chance to evaluate those young players and see where they are? Yeah, yeah. And for the veteran players, I know Todd Richards likes to have about five games for the veteran players to get ready for the for the regular season start. But there's going to be a lot of young players who, who are going to need every opportunity they have or they can get into uh, in, in the preseason to get ready and compete for those spots that might be open. You talk about Todd likes having them play about five preseason games. Those veterans, how many of those preseason games do they like to play? Uh, I think most most guys like to play about four or five to get ready. I don't think that you can just turn the switch on, play a couple games, and then play in October and st start the regular season the way we want to start. And that's one of the things we've emphasized uh, all off season now is that we want to be ready when the uh, regular season starts right from the uh, first game. All right, speaking of that, let's roll into October here. There's still, uh, as we get into October, a couple of preseason games right at the beginning. Carolina and Nashville both at home. And then that regular season gets underway in Buffalo on October the 9th. That's a Thursday night. Two nights later, you come back to take on the New York Rangers in the home opener. That's a pretty good week right there. Buffalo is a young team, didn't finish uh, well last year. They finished last. They're going to have a lot of things that they want to prove this year. And you come right back home, right back home to refuel that rivalry that you developed with the Rangers last year. Yeah, dangerous first game. You, you never want to underestimate Buffalo no matter where they finish this year. They're going to be coming out hard, hard right off the gate. And uh, Rangers, obviously, a great rivalry for us. It kind of started developing that that uh, little bit of an animosity there between the two teams. So it's going to be interesting. They're they're a hard team. They're a tough team. They went to the Stanley Cup Finals. They're the uh, conference champions, and we want to be ready for that one for sure. But but the good starts a key for us this year. There's two points for every game. We want to start well. 
when you talk about that Rangers rivalry, when you go back to that game last year when Rick Nash played his first game here, not as a member of the Blue Jackets, did that surprise you how quickly that whole thing took off and, and the level of, for lack of a better word, the level of hatred between the two clubs in that game? Uh, I don't know if it surprised me. I think it's a, that's part of hockey. I think those rivalries are the best things that, that can happen in hockey when you create two, two teams that start... I think hate's a strong word, but the, but uh, you know having strong feelings towards each other and not necessarily liking each other, so uh, it's it's a great rivalry in making. I hope I hope we can develop and make it even better next year. As you continue to look at the October schedule, you see right off the bat three of the first four games are at home, and then there's a trip out to California. You just mentioned wanting to get off to a good start. I know that's something you've talked about. Todd Richards has talked about. You have to get off to a better a better start when you look at this schedule. And you have three of those first four at home. And then you have uh, the trip, Ottawa, San Jose, Anaheim, L.A. How do you look at that California trip? Is that a bad thing to have that that early in the year, especially when your team's never the same from year to year? You'll have some different components to it. Is that a good team bonding trip right off the bat? It can be. It's, it's obviously going to be a great test for our team. Those are three of the best teams in the league, the Stanley Cup champions and, and uh now, I think we, that's a good opportunity for our team to get together, have a little bit of bonding. Maybe we'll go a day early or something and, and get ready and know that it's going to be a big challenge ahead of us. And, and uh, you know, everybody knows that those are the three, some of the toughest games that you're going to have all year. Might as well get them out of the way. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, do you prefer those teams early in the year, at the end of the year, or does it really matter? I don't think it matters. You can think of it one way or the other way, and then you know your, your thought process might be completely wrong at the end of the day. All teams in this league are very good, and you can never underestimate anybody, and you're going to have to face the toughest opponents at some point, so you got to be ready. All right, let's take a look at the November schedule now as we continue on here and just take a, a little peek into November. And uh, there you see four weekends straight, back-to-back -back games, and each one of them, you have one at home and one on the road. Back-to-backs are a big discussion in this sport because you love to have that day in between games to kind of regroup. But how do you look at that schedule right there and see those four straight weekends of back-to-back -back games? Well, when we look at the back-to-backs, we want to look at the, the recovery. We want to look at the travel. We want to look at the time zone. So uh, those those trips are short short flights. Eastern Eastern uh, Conference helps, obviously, in the, and we only gain time in those. So they're all good. There's going to be back-to-backs. you got to live with them. you got to be ready, and you got to be in shape to play them. And, and, uh, I think those are all favorable for us. Rolling on to December here, as you start to get close to the end of the calendar year, Blue Jackets, again, you see a lot of blue dates up there, which means a lot of home games, only four road trips throughout the month of December. I would imagine as you look at that, that's one of those months where seeing all those home games, you would feel comfortable in having a real opportunity to get a lot of points there. Yeah, I we got a great, obviously a great home advantage here with with our fans and the atmosphere we can create for the players and we want to be a good home team at the same time you gotta be a good road team too so I always kinda of try to stay neutral on that thing we see a lot of home games we see a lot of tough opponents too so we better better bring our best game in December too well speaking of best games there's going to be one in January that doesn't even really necessarily uh, involve the Blue Jackets as a team and that is at the end you see the 24th 25th all-Star Weekend, you also see a lot of road games leading up to that as they'll be getting ready for the All-Star Weekend here in Columbus. Uh, big trip to start it right off, out to Arizona, then Colorado and Dallas and, and Toronto. But, man, as you work toward the end of that month, that's going to be a very exciting time, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great, great time for the franchise and the city of Columbus. It's going to be a great event, and I'm sure we're going to do a great job to to show us what we, or show everybody in the league and around the league what we have here. You've been involved in these things before. You've been to them. You know the caliber. The best players in the world are there for the weekend. And how excited are you that you get to showcase your building, your city, as you just said, and that, you know, there was a lot of talk here in 2007 after the draft was held in Columbus about what a great situation this was here. Is the All-Star Game going to be a repeat of that? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I was here obviously for the draft, and I thought Columbus did a great job then, and it was a great city to visit. I'd only come to the rink before that, and and at that time it was a little bit, little bit more relaxed, where you got to visit some restaurants and see the downtown area a bit. I think the All Star Game is going to be more of the same. We're going to be ready, and we're going to do a great job of, of showing everybody what what Columbus is all about. All right, takes you through January. Flip over to February here, and take a quick look at that. February schedule again. Uh, you see back-to-back -back games the first two weekends, but as you said, short trips there. All of those short trips, and you've got Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, the Islanders, the Rangers, all of those division opponents that you've got to play 
in that month of February. Yeah, the one thing in, in this month that you can see, in the, we, we go from playing St. Louis at home to Ottawa, it's immigration. That's the one thing that I forgot to mention when we look at the back-to-back. -back. So, you know, might be a little bit later that we get to bed when we face Ottawa, but th those are some of the things that, that we have to uh, live with and, and do it as, as quickly as possible, and Canadian teams face that all the time when they come to this site. But uh, other than that, short trips again and good recovery, so should be all good. Yeah, you're right. Uh, coming home from St. Louis and play, or going to Ottawa, yes, immigration there, and then Montreal, New York, going to have to clear customs in New York. So, like you said, I, you can only make so many demands, right? O only so much you can yeah, control. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We just have to live with it and try to travel as effectively as we can. All right, moving on to March as we really get down the stretch now, and this is where you hope that you're uh, really getting a push to go into the playoffs and trying to secure home ice advantage and all of those things. And you look right in the middle of the month there, and you see that trip, Edmonton, Vancouver, Calgary. That's a trip that can be challenging in its own right. That's kind of a compacted trip this time around, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's one back-to-back -back there, but we gain one, one hour from going from Edmonton to Vancouver, so that'll help with our recovery time there. And then we get have Calgary at the end of it. It's three and four nights. It's a tough schedule, but the, there's, there's a lot of those. And in the last two seasons, we've, we've been used to having a lot more of those because of the Olympics and because of the compressed schedule of the shortened season. So this year, as a whole, the schedule is going to be a lot easier than it was before. I do have to ask you this. The Blue Jackets just moved to the East last year. So they were, to me, they were essentially a Western Conference team. They were used to the travel and what you had to go through and going through all the, those time zones. How long does it take for that to wear off to where now you have that Eastern mindset mentality and those trips become tougher? Well, I think that you still have so few of them that I think that in the beginning we talked about bonding. This can be bonding towards hopefully towards the playoffs at that time where we get we start getting ready for the playoffs and, and it's a good time for the team to be together for four days, four or five days on the road. So I think the road trips are good for a young team and we can we can use a couple of them during the year. And as we take one more look at this March schedule, not a lot of uh, Sunday dates at home, but you see one on the 15th, a 5 o'clock Sunday start, so, uh, you know, a nice early game. I know th those are nice for the fans. I know for the players, they kind of throw their timing off, but they make adjustments, right? Oh, yeah. These these guys are pros. They know what to, what's expected, and, and they adjust accordingly, so if the game's earlier, they get up a little earlier. We might not have a morning skate because of the time of the game, but but they have their routines, and they, they're, they're used to playing at noon or 5 at, or at 7.30. Okay, be honest. When you were a player, the day you knew there wasn't going to be a morning skate, was that a good day or a bad day? Well, those days it seemed like there was always a morning skate. Now and now it's like a, it's, it's history. So it's, I think you, you better just stay in at today's uh, what we do today rather than going 20 years back. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the final month of the regular season schedule in April. The one thing that jumps out to me about this is you see four home games, four of your last six are at home, and I know you don't want to be banking on having to pick up points to get in at this time. However, that being said, is there any kind of an advantage to having those uh, those four games at home right down the stretch? Well, we always hope that we have advantage because of the home crowd that we have and we're playing in our home rink, but again, every opponent's tough. you got to approach it like it's your most important game every night. 82 times a year, right from the start. We've said that enough, but uh, there's going to be tough opponents there again. The Islanders are going to be better next year. Pittsburgh Penguins, a tough team. Toronto and, and Buffalo, they're all going to be tough opponents, but we, we uh, got to take advantage of our home rink, that's for sure. And you flip it uh, this year a couple of times. You have the Montreal Canadiens coming in here twice. The Toronto Maple Leafs will come in here twice. Everywhere last year you went two times, they'll come in here two times. Do you like that rotation and the way that uh, the schedule flips from year to year with those teams that are outside of your division? Yeah, absolutely. And and, and the fact that we see all the Western teams once and, and we play everybody, so that's going to be a great opportunity for the fans. And I was going to ask you, that's important to you because you want to see everybody play, but from a fan standpoint, how nice is it? that you do get to see the defending Stanley Cup champion LA Kings come in once. You do get to see the San Jose Sharks. Even if it's one time, you do get that opportunity to see everybody. Yeah, and their fans get to see our team once, so that's good. It's all good. Well, their fans might not like to see your team <laughs> if you have your way, right? Yeah, that's what we're hoping for. <laughs> all right, well, this Friday is going to be the draft, the first round of the draft, Friday and Saturday, two days of the NHL draft in Philadelphia. And uh, once again, this guy's going to be very busy. You don't stop working when the season's over. You've been working very hard with your scouts leading up to this week. And what's it been like for you from the end of the regular season 
just talking about the draft itself, the amateur portion of this, and gathering information and having meetings and making sure that you have everything in the line when you head out there tomorrow to Philadelphia. Well, scouts do, though. Obviously, they do most of the work. They travel all year long. They watch all those games and, and repeatedly, repeatedly, a couple hundred, 250 games, some of the scouts watch all year long. And uh, after the season, we had our meetings, we put most of our list together. Then we had the combine, testing in interviews. We had our team psychologist there. We had our strength and conditioning coaches there. So we've gathered a lot of information. We're going to get together tomorrow in Philly, have some meetings Wednesday, Thursday, leading up to the draft on Friday, the first rounds on Friday, and then we'll we'll clean up the uh, two to seven on Saturday, and and uh, we'll be ready. Well, there's a couple more things that we want to have off our checklist in the next couple of days, but the scouts have done a great job again, and the lists are almost ready, and and uh, it's an exciting time for the franchise. Do you ever miss those days of being a scout when you were out seeing those many games? You probably don't miss all those long drives against uh, in the wintertime in upstate New York or somewhere in Canada where the weather's bad, but you can very much appreciate what those guys are going through from the way that you came up and, uh, and how you got this job by doing that very same thing. Absolutely. It's a hard job, but it's a very important job for the, uh, for the organizations. And if we want to get better, we have to draft well. And uh, this is an exciting time for the scouts, it's an exciting time for me still because, of the, uh, because I've done it so many times and so many, so many different drafts. But this is their Stanley Cup. They're, that, this is what they're gearing up all year long. The suits are oppressed and ready to go for next weekend, and, and uh, they're ready to announce our picks. And for you, last year was your first time going to the draft table as the general manager for this team. You had three first-round draft picks that you made last year at the draft. Going into this week, as we sit and talk right now, you have one first-round draft pick. Uh, it's right in the middle of the, of the pack at number 16. So obviously... You're in a much better position than you were last year. It means your team had better success than it did last year. For you, what changes, if anything, having those three number one picks or having just one as it stands right now? Is it the same amount of preparation? Is it was it more pressure last year trying to get all the right guys with those picks or what changes? Anything? Well, last year I, I said that it's a great opportunity. I don't see it as pressure. I thought it was a great opportunity. I think we got three really good young forwards with our picks last year and some other good prospects too. We're going to prepare the same way even if we have one pick right now. I've been, I've had 21st pick overall at the draft at this time and then we ended up having second overall pick and 21st with Ottawa that year. So anything can happen between now and the draft but we have to prepare the list as, you know, whatever hap can happen. So the list has to be ready and then we're just going to follow the list and, and pick accordingly. It's funny, you say anything can happen and there's a lot of talk during the playoffs but People don't tend to make a lot of moves during the playoffs. Uh, Dale Talon, the general manager of the Florida Panthers, had put it out there weeks ago that he would be open to trading the number one overall pick if he got the right package. As of right now, again, that hasn't happened. But do you expect that whether it be today or tomorrow or Wednesday, every year people in my business speculate how busy it's going to be and how many guys are going to change teams and this and that. Do you think that will happen this year? Yeah, I think things are going to start heating up again. Just... Uh Everybody's going to travel to Philadelphia tomorrow or Wednesday, and phones are going to get uh, heated up, and, and there's going to be a lot of discussion. I've already had several discussions about moving up, moving back. Teams are thinking about it. Everybody's kind of forming their own strategy of how they want to run things, depending on where they're at right now, how they have multiple picks in different rounds. Uh, we might have two seconds, two thirds. We'll find out before the draft, and that'll change our strategy a little bit. If we have two seconds, two thirds, we might be moving up. If we don't have the player available at 16 that we like, we might be moving back. And we've already identified the teams that have multiple picks behind us. So we'll see a lot of things, a lot of things, and it's exciting and, and a lot of speculation. Yeah, I want to ask you your philosophy. Are you a best player available guy or? It seems to me you have a little bit of luxury right now because you got a lot of forwards last year. The defense, you've had depth on that. You got depth in goaltending a couple of years ago. So is there an area where you feel like you definitely have to draft or are you just looking at who's the best guy available when we hit number 16, if that's where you wind up? As a general rule, I'd always say that we pick the best player available. That's You can't go based on need because by the time that player gets ready our needs could be completely different because it might take three to five years before he's ready to play or have an impact so best player available but 
after the first couple of rounds, you're going to look at your depth chart and say, okay, let's start filling some needs here. We don't have enough this or we don't have enough that. And let's draft. We've already maybe drafted a couple more forwards, so let's draft some defensemen. But um, a good young defenseman could be a, could be something that we're looking at for sure. Like you said, we had three forwards with our first round picks last year. But we also picked Oliver Bjorkstrand in the third round, and he had a tremendous year um, in the Western League. He was third leading scorer in the league in the regular season and won the scoring in the playoffs. And uh, so we, we have a lot of bright uh, young forwards with great future ahead of them. So maybe, maybe a defenseman is something that we're looking at right now. But again, best player available for sure with the first pick. I'm glad you brought Oliver up because I wanted to ask you, uh, your three first-round picks last year, Alexander Wenberg, Kirby Reichel, Marco Dano, you've got them all under contract. Marco actually played in Springfield at the end of the year, so he got a little bit of uh, North American pro experience for you. The other two guys you have signed now, when you look at those three, you look at uh, York Strand coming into development camp next month and then going into regular training camp. How much of a chance do these guys have to open some eyes and maybe be last year's Boone Jenner, a guy that came in, got an opportunity, made the most of it, and wound up having a great rookie season. I think they'll they'll all have a great opportunity. I think that the uh, they're working hard right now. Marco Dano's come here and he's working with our group here. Uh, young guys have volunteered to come and, and, and put in their time to get stronger. Uh, Wenberg is coming soon. He's He had a great year. Kirby Reichel's coming soon. He, he was he was great in the playoffs, great in the Memorial Cup, and we're glad we have all those guys signed. So they're all going to have their opportunities, that's for sure. And, and uh, we talked about those exhibition games where there's Traverse City Tournament. We have the development camp. There, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for those guys to show what they have, whether they have the physical maturity, mental maturity that it takes to be an NHL player. We're not going to try to fast forward any of them. Uh, not going to push. But if they... Uh, if they're ready, they're ready, and we'll see it. And that's our job to to evaluate. How much do those junior stats translate into the NHL? And you, you can play and have 50 goals, 109 points, playing junior hockey. When you look at those numbers, how much do you? Uh, how do you look at them? Do you figure this guy can? Have, if he has 50 goals in junior, how many can you project? Maybe uh, he would have in a good year in the NHL. I think it's on individual basis. I think numbers are great. They don't lie. If you score 50 goals, it's 50 goals, but it's not It's not translatable into the NHL numbers. Like I said, you have to have the mental maturity, physical maturity to play on this level. Everything is harder, skating, pace, physical play, and the, the quickness of thinking and the instincts. So uh, it's another step. It's a huge step. Some guys can make it quicker. Some For some guys, it takes, it takes a little longer, and, and you can still have a great 15-year career, even if you make it to the league as a 23-year-old. So don't rush, don't fast forward, let them take their time and develop, and, and when they're ready, they'll tell us with their play. Talking about 23 years old like it's old, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, one last thing I've got to ask you. Do you see any team showing up on the draft floor Friday night not having a head coach already in place? No, I, I think it's all going to get sorted out, but I can't speak for anybody else, but that's my hunch. Well, that's, that's what I've been saying on the show for the last two weeks because... I wouldn't want to show up as a GM at the draft not having one because I would imagine people would be standing outside your door, your phone would never stop ringing. And that may still happen anyway, whether you have a coach or not, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's some of the uh, the occupational hazards. <laughs> the phone is ringing quite often anyways, no matter what's happening. So, But I think everybody will have a head coach by then. Well, thanks for putting yours on silent during this. I appreciate that. I, I can't believe <laughs> it hasn't rung the whole time. That's my pleasure. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I'll bet it is. Yarmo, thank you very much. Uh, we'll catch up with you again in Philadelphia, and thanks for taking some time to do my this. My pleasure. Yarmo Kekalainen, the head, or the uh, yeah, general manager, head coach. He's not the head coach. He's going to give the head coach some tools to work with, though, for sure, uh, coming up in the draft. And that is going to be on Friday, first round Friday night. And uh, we will be there. I will be there. Jody Shelley will be there. Jeff Rimmer will be there. We'll be bringing you coverage of the first round of the draft on Friday night. The draft will continue rounds two through seven coming up on Saturday. Let's just put a bow on this thing. Let's wrap it up. We've got a couple more days of CBJ and 30 before we uh, head out to Philadelphia for the draft, so make sure that you uh, just find out everything you need to know at bluejackets.com. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter, at Bobby Mac Sports. Uh, the Blue Jackets, are, everybody's on Twitter. If you, if you want to know anything, it's very simple to do, right? Pull out your phone, pull out your iPad, turn on your computer. It's easy to do. But it's coming up on Friday. 
round one of the draft, and I'll be back to continue with this show tomorrow at 1130. Until then, for Yarmo Kekalainen, I'm Bob McElligot saying thanks for tuning in today here on CBJ in 30.